Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Pastor Orbin. And good evening to everyone again. It's good to have you in our study session as we examine the Word of God and we learn the truth from the Word of God as God will want to impart that truth to our hearts. We are in the book of Revelation and we are examining the 20th chapter in relation to the millennium. And this is in connection with the kingdom of God, because remember, we are on the theme of the kingdom of God. And we're looking at the, the concept of a millennial kingdom, which is the literal thousand year reign when Christ returns to the earth. And this is believed by the premillennial group, which comprises of the majority of the evangelical um, churches. And that's the particular um, theological perspective that they have in relation um, to the kingdom of God. They believe that a literal kingdom must be set up. And since that was not established in Christ's first advent, they're expecting that this physical reign will take place sometime in the future. We don't know exactly when that time will be, but according to them, it will happen when um, after the rapture and the great tribulation is completed. Then Christ will come back and he will set up this thousand year reign. And we are examining the scriptures to see if this is an accurate interpretation of the word of God. And if this is the teaching that we can ascertain as we examine the scriptures. We did identify the fact last week that the millennium is only mentioned in the book of Revelation. We don't see it in any other part of the scripture in the New Testament, nor in the, the prophecies. Even though we indicated that there's some prophecies which we have to examine, which they interpret to refer to the millennial kingdom. We would agree that they refer to the kingdom of God, but we would examine these scriptures to identify the fact as to whether they were referring to Christ's first advent and the establishment of his kingdom when he came to earth, or if this is an actual fact referring to a millennial kingdom, which is a future reign of Christ for that thousand year period. We have recognized that when dealing with apocalyptic literature, there's a lot of figurative and symbolic language used. And so if we are to do a proper exegesis or hermeneutics of the word, we must bear that in mind. We must take into consideration the literary genre that is used because that is very critical in our understanding. So we say the word millennium is not actually used in the text. It's a word that we would have derived from the Latin, which means a thousand years. And that's how we arrive at the term millennium. But Revelation 20 does mention a reign of a thousand years, but not the actual word millennium is used in that text. Recognize the fact that Jesus taught a lot of things about his kingdom, but he never mentioned this thousand year reign, which was a future event. We never saw it mentioned by Peter or Paul or any of the apostles. And we never saw even the mention of a thousand year reign um, by any of the prophets that would have been speaking um, very significantly of the kingdom of God. I would have given you some passages in Isaiah to study. And we are going to look at some of these passages um, tonight because these are passages that the pre would use to draw the conclusion that they're referring to a millennial kingdom because some of the things identified in those passages have not actually occurred as yet. The reality is, if it's figurative language and not meant to be taken literally, that's the reality as to why they will not have occurred. Because remember when we were looking at some of the literature in relation to the statement that Jesus would use in Matthew 20 about the moon turning to blood and the sun not giving light and the stars falling from heaven, we saw that, that same type of language was used speaking of the destruction of Babylon, destruction of Egypt, and the destruction of Edom. And that same language was used, and those people never experienced the moon turning to blood. They never experienced the stars falling from heaven, or they never experienced a total blackout of the sun. So which means that that was judgment language used. It was poetic language. It was figurative language. And so it was meant to be understood that way. So since we had evidence of that language being used, and yet those things never were practically realized, we can also conclude then that some of the literature used in referring to the kingdom of God 
Well, the premillennialists might argue that we have not seen these things happen, so it means that they have to be fulfilled because they were spoken of. That could be the result of the fact that the language used was figurative language and was never meant to be realized in, in a literal way. And that's why they would not have an experience in the life of, of the Jews. Last week, I also listed a number of the tenets of the premillennialists in relation to how they interpret the book of Revelations. And I tried to engage you in some dialogue to see if you could counteract some of these arguments that they were using in relation to how they interpreted the passage and whether it would stand the test of, of other references in the Bible, because remember one of the, the principles we must use in interpreting the word is that we will always compare scripture upon scripture. Let the Bible interpret itself and let uh, easier passages interpret passages that are figurative and might be a little more difficult um, to interpret, which means that we have to check other references and I was hoping that you would have remembered some of the things that we would have done early up, but we did not have a deep engagement in relation to those particular aspects, which I will want to just briefly review tonight because there, there are scriptures that we can use which will refute some of the arguments that they're putting forward. I did indicate that some people might not have been in the study from the very beginning, so they might have missed some of these references that we were that we had used um, to counteract counteract some of the arguments that the premillennialists use in, in the way they um, look at the ending of the world and their perspective on end time events. So what I will do tonight is to glance at a few of these passages quickly so that we will be able to tie things together and you can see the arguments that you can use to justify why we believe what we believe in relation to these particular references concerning the kingdom of God, concerning the end of the world and what it is going to be like when Christ returns. Because remember we said it's a full narrative and we have to be careful that we do not isolate parts of it and then miss the whole picture and do not get the full truth of the word of God. So that's why it's important that we examine other scriptural references so that we get the full picture and understand precisely what the Bible is saying. Bearing in mind that the Bible is not going to contradict itself. It is not going to give different arguments for the same point. So it means then that if we have difficulty in interpreting scriptural references that might be um, highly symbolic, we have to look for clear references which do not contain as much symbolism and then we can understand precisely what the word is saying. So let's then glance back at some of these things that we identified as the tenets of the premillennialists in relation to this um, millennial kingdom and their interpretation of Revelation chapter 20. One of the things I identified is that they said that during the millennium, Christ would reign on the throne, literally reign on the throne in Jerusalem, and, and David would be his vice president, or David would be reigning then alongside of Christ. And I indicated to you that the Bible does not support that position because the, the, the Bible actually um, indicated that when Christ is reigning, David will be dead. So if that reference is, is accurate, it means that it cannot be applied to the millennium because then Christ and David will be reigning alongside of each other and David will be alive. Which meant that that reference that was given in the book of Samuel, remember I mentioned that Nathan the prophet, and Nathan is not a major prophet nor a minor prophet. But, but he gave some significant words, which were prophetic words that God would have given to him to share with David. So I want to glance back at that passage. I mentioned it, but I did not actually look at it or engage you in it. That was 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13. And this is to refute the argument that Christ and David were reign side by side in the millennium when the scripture actually did teach that when Christ is reigning, David will actually be resting with his fathers, meaning that he will be dead. So this will have to be a scripture then that was prophesying about Christ's reign in his kingdom in his first advent and not his return to the earth in his second advent. So we look at that. Second Samuel chapter 7, 
verse 12 to 13. Nathan said to David, And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, some people are inclined to think that that prophecy was referring to Solomon being of the seed of David and that he will build a house, meaning build a temple for God. And that was the interpretation that some people wanted to apply to that. But it really would not have been referring to Solomon because it says, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And, and Solomon's kingdom was not an everlasting kingdom. He reigned for four years. King David reigned for 40 years. I think Saul, the first three kings of Israel, each of them incidentally, reigned for a period of 40 years. So the mention then of a, a throne and a kingdom that will last forever will obviously have to be a reference to Christ's kingdom, which Daniel also said was a kingdom that was going to be an everlasting kingdom when it was established. And the final sentence says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. So this is obviously a prophecy referring to Jesus and it is referring to his kingdom which will be established when he came. And during that first advent, obviously David would have been sleeping with his fathers which meant that he would have been the earth as a dead person. So it could not have been referring to the millennial kingdom. It would have had to be referring, yes, it's the kingdom passage, but referring to the kingdom of Christ at his first advent. Uh, and this is what I believe um, is, is, is the reference that Isaiah would have been making in many of the passages which we will look at and one of them is Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 which is sort of corresponding to the prophecy that Nathan made here saying that God will set up an offspring out of the line of David and, and if you notice in, in Luke's first chapter where he identified the lineage of David, it traced right back to David's line, right back to the, the um, this Shemitic line through Abraham because all of, of those persons would have descended from the line of, of Shem, one of, of Noah's son and sons. And that's how we get the, the term Shemitic. In, in our more modern vernacular, we have dropped the H, and we say Semitic. So the Jews are referred to as the Semitic line, but really it's the Shemitic, or the Shemites, which is the line coming from Shem. And right through that line, Abraham coming right down through David, right down um, through Jesse, I should say, through David, and onto Christ. That's the lineage through which um, Christ would have come. And Nathan is prophesying here that, that, that the Messiah that will come and establish his kingdom will come through David's line. And Isaiah also saw that, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. He says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. Now again, watch the language. A rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, is that literal? Certainly not. It's figurative language, but that is also saying precisely what Nathan was telling David, that a descendant is going to come out of his lineage who will be the person to set up an everlasting kingdom. And obviously, this was in reference to Christ. Now, I want to look a little further at Isaiah chapter 11 while we are there, because this is one of the passages that the premillennials would use to support their um, idea that because this is a passage that has not yet been fulfilled, it means that it will have to be something realized in the millennium. And we will look at it to see why they will not be justified in that particular um, interpretation. So let's read right through Isaiah because we need to understand the figurative language and we cannot take part of it as figurative and then the other part are literal. 
And if we look at the, the, the full passage, we will see the intent of the, of the author here. So we pick up from verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall, be, shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. Watch the language again. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, is that saying that his breath will be so bad that people will die as a result? No, that is, that is not literal language. That's figurative language. It means that the words that, that are spoken from his lips will bring judgment to the earth. And it will be the things that will bring condemnation to those who are wicked. The righteous shall be the girdle of his loins. Watch the language again. And the faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. Now this is the part here. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead him. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young one shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the ass. That's a very poisonous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Another term for the snake. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for a sign of the people. So to it shall the Gentiles seek, and the rest shall be glorious. So we can um, stop at that point. So what the prevalence are saying is that we have not yet experienced the lion and the lamb laying out together, a child being able to put his hand in a snake's den and not um, be bitten and die as a result of snake poison. We have not seen a lion eat straw like the ox. So because we have not realized these things, it means that that prophecy will only be fulfilled in millennium where everything would be in a perfect, harmonious nature. That the, the, the whole nature of animals will change. And, and that's how they view this particular passage. Now you can respond to me when I give a little break for a response when we look at some other passages in Isaiah, and you will tell me if you think that it's, a, it's to be taken literally, and if you are to expect this as a future event, or if you interpret as many um, amillennialists interpret it to mean that it's just a symbolic expression of the kingdom of God which will come in Christ's reign, and the nature of, of people who are part of that kingdom will change. Okay, and the hostile person will become a more peaceful person with Christ reigning in their heart. So that is how that passage is interpreted. Now we can look at some other passages while we are here, so that we won't have to be jumping, you know, from one section to the next. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter two and come forward with some of the other passages that I will have given you. Isaiah chapter two. The word of the Lord, reading from the first verse, that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. I remember we went through that concept already, that the last days is a term used even in the New Testament to refer to the dispensation that we are in, which started when Christ um, came to the earth. And that represented the last days. And Paul said, in the book of Hebrews, that, that God has spoken to us through the prophets, and in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, meaning that he was speaking to us um, in this current dispensation through, through Jesus Christ. So the last days is not necessarily referring to the end of the world. When we are referring to the end of the world, we will see the term 
then we look at the book of John, the last day. So it says, in the last days, referring to the time when Christ will come, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow, flow into it. And this is speaking of Jerusalem because remember Jerusalem was the, was the capital of, of, of Judah, but it was also the spiritual capital. That's where the temple of, of God was and that's where people came to worship. And many people shall go and say, come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and, he, and we will walk in this path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. See, that's with the words, as Isaiah said, from his mouth. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Again, the argument is that this has not been literally realized. We are still in, in a world where there is war. And what they're saying is that during the millennium, there will be perfect peace and there shall be no war. So they interpret this to me. They shall beat their spears the sword, sorry, into plowshares. So the, the, the war implements will be used for agriculture and the spears into pruning hooks. But again, my expression and my understanding is that this is a figurative, this is a poetic way of Isaiah expressing what the nature of the kingdom of Christ will be like when he comes. And he's using figurative language. He's using poetic language. And he's expressing it in a, in a way to, to get us to understand that there'll be a significant change in the nature of people who receive Christ as their Lord and, and who are reigning with him in his spiritual kingdom. So yes, there'll be a change. We, we spoke about the kingdom of peace. It is reigning with him. So when we talk about nation, um, knowing no war, it is not speaking about war in the sense that there will be no war on the earth, but, but people who are part of the kingdom of Christ and whose Christ is whose heart Christ is reigning, that would be a kingdom of peace. There will be peace among those people. There will be peace among the nations whose God is is the Lord, and who have Christ as their Savior. But this is another verse that they use to say this is referring to the millennium. So we do agree on one point that the passages are referring to a kingdom. They conclude it's referring to the millennial kingdom. Because they are arguing that they are to be literally fulfilled. And since these things have not happened as yet, it has to be in a millennium which will come when Christ returns to the earth. And we will see from some other references that there are a number of things that have to add up to make that a reality according to, to biblical interpretation. Now, they used to argue that the, the, the Old Testament did not see the church age. They did not see the Gentiles. But we have seen two passages here mentioned about the Gentiles being, um, having access to the, the, the kingdom of, of God and, 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 and coming in to a relationship with Christ. So in fact, the, the, the kingdom of God in relation to the Gentiles was actually seen in the Old Testament. Now another passage was Isaiah chapter 35. This is literally interpreted by them again to, to refer to the millennium. Right, so this is where the connection is. That's why I'm dealing with these passages because I told you that we will delay them until we look at the millennium. There are kind of passages, but we believe that they're referring to the kingdom that Christ established when he came on earth. And they believe that because these things were not literally fulfilled, because they are making a literal interpretation, that they have to take place in the millennium. So this is their argument for a thousand year, literal thousand year reign in the future. But we say no to that. Let's look at Isaiah 35, another passage that they use. First verse. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency 
of our God. Strengthen ye with the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even with go, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and the streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty spring of water in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass and reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the way fair men do fool shall not ere they in. No lion shall be there, and no ravenous beast. So you see, if they're talking about the lion, they know the lamb. Now this says, no lion shall be there. So if they're using this as a millennial kingdom passage, you know, it's going to contradict their interpretation of the other passage, the land laying down with the lamb. No land shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up there on. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zen with sound of a lasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now, again, this is a Canaan passage. We believe that this is Isaiah's um, symbolic or poetic way of expressing the nature of the kingdom of God, which we believe came at his first advent. One more passage, Isaiah 65. Now, there are other passages, but we're not going to look at all of them, but these are the ones I would have given you um, to look at. All right, a short one here from Isaiah 40 before we get to 65. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read for verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak, be comfortable to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she have received the Lord's hand double for her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Remember, um, This is referring to, to um, um, John the Baptist. Sorry, it wouldn't, it wouldn't come to my mind. John the Baptist speaking in this term. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's another prophecy of Isaiah. Watch the language. Does he mean that every valley and every every mountain will be made low and every valley will be exalted? And every place became a plain. So the mountain, the mountains will be, will be pushed down and the valleys will be raised up literally. No, he's not speaking in a literal term here. He's speaking again in poetic language, speaking of the kingdom of God. Isaiah 65. I read from verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But ye be glad and rejoice forever in that which I will create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and for her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and the joy of my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, not an old man that have not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner shall be a hundred years old, shall be, a, shall be a curse. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat fruit of them. 
they shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another reap, another eat, sorry, for as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and they are spring with them. And it shall come to pass that before the call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, saith the Lord. All right, that's just a, a sort of repetition of, of a previous passage which Isaiah would have used. Verse chapter 60, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness of the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and the glory shall be upon thee. And the Gentiles, watch the mention of the Gentiles, shall come to the light, and kings to the brightness of the rising. Now remember we said that the binding of Satan represented the control that Satan had exercised in restricting the gospel from the Gentiles. But here Isaiah is seeing that when the kingdom of Christ was established, that the Gentiles will come to the knowledge of God. And the gross darkness that they were in and that the Gentile world was in will now vanish because of the presence of Christ. And, and we indicated that Revelation 20 actually, in the, uh, actually said that Satan's binding was in relation to him not being able to deceive the nations. And the nations, remember, we said, is often used as a reference to the Gentile nations because the, the, the kingdom message was predominantly for the Jews. And prior to that, all the Gentile nations were, were basically alienated from, from, the, from the kingdom of, of God and from the experience which the Jews would have had and they were deceived by the enemy into following um, pagan practices and following um, idolatrous uh, practices and worshiping other deities. And, and therefore, they were not exposed to the, to the gospel message, which would bring light and knowledge and salvation to them. So, again, this is another passage that refutes the idea that the Old Testament prophets did not see the church age, that they did not, they did not see the, the, the kingdom as, as we are indicating that, that, that they saw and that they were referring to the millennial kingdom. Now, I am arguing that most of these passages that you will see in Isaiah, and there are numerous others, but we will not look at them, are referring to the, the kingdom of God coming at the advent of Christ. Christ established a spiritual kingdom, and the gospel was, was preached to the Gentiles, during the time of, 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 of Christ and at, long afterwards then when the disciples um, spread the gospel to the Gentile nations, they were able to, to receive um, the gospel in a way that was restricted from them because of the blindness in their hearts that Satan had deceived them into falling after pagan gods and pagan rituals. And so our argument is that Satan bone was not literally bone it was just a figurative expression of the restraint and control which the holy spirit and the power of christ would would have been um holding over satan that he could not deceive the nations and that during the time that we are living in now the gospel is able to be proclaimed throughout the gentile world and people are given access to the kingdom of God. Now think about it, if Satan was not restrained in, in, in some way, we could just imagine the havoc that be wrecked on the, on the world if Satan had full authority and full power to do as he pleased. So there's definitely a restraint on, on Satan, if you want to look at it even in, in, in that regard. And so I have no difficulty in accepting the spiritual application that Satan being bound is not literally putting a chain on him and dropping him in a bottomless pit and, and, and putting the key to lock him away. It is exercising control. And I gave you some passages which you were able to look at. Um, one, one of them that was um, coming directly from Jesus was Matthew chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, where he's speaking about entering into the strong man's house and binding him. 
And then there were some other passages which corresponded with that to show that there is a figurative application of the binding of Satan and not that he is, is completely removed from being able to influence people for evil because the argument is that how can Satan be bound and there's still evil in the world? There's still sin in the world. The reality is the Bible never said that the binding of Satan was to stop sin or to stop evil or to stop things that are, are not of God. It says that he was bound, that he would not restrict the gospel from reaching the Gentile nations. Because the reality is that even if we were to bind Satan, and even during the millennium, if they want to literally say that Satan will be put away, then they have to explain why there's still going to be sin in the millennium and why would people still have to be saved from sin. The reality is that it's the world, it's the flesh, and it's Satan that we have to deal with. So even if you literally put away Satan, that he will not be able to influence anybody at all. The reality is that we will still sin because we have the flesh, which is carnal, which is prone to sin, our own thoughts. The Bible said that we are led away with our own desires. And it's the flesh and the mind that is enmity against God. It's the carnal mind. So even our thought processing, evil goes on inside of us apart from the devil influencing us. And the devil will not deal with every individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So it means that we are led away by our own thought patterns, our own desires, and then there's the world. There's the system of the world and the corruption that is in the world, the enticement of the world that leads people um, away from God. So, so if the, the reality is that even if you were to put away Satan, you are still going to, to have... Um, wrongdoing and sin so we, we can't use the argument then well how come satan is bound and yet you still have sin in the world that's their argument for saying that satan is not really bound and that he'll be bound during the millennium but yet you're still going to get um sin in the millennium okay so we cover that now another point that i made coming from their their line of argument is, is that the end of the world does not mean the end of the world. So when we see the Bible mentioning the end of the world, it means the end of the age. That's their argument. You see, they're trying to get around a lot of scriptures which speak of the end of the world relating to Christ's return. And we're going to look at a few passages again because I was hoping that you would have been able to give me some of these passages to show their argument can't hold. As a matter of fact, the New Testament speaks of the end of the world and the end of the age as the same. So the end of the world refers to the end of all things. The end of the age, because the Bible speaks of this age and the age to come. If you look at the New Testament, you will see that the writers often spoke of this age and the age to come. So it, it means that the end of the world is technically speaking the end of the age. But they want to bring a difference because they want to argue that the end of the world does not mean the end of everything because they have to fit space in for the millennium. So if we conclude that the end of the world means that it's the end of all things, then there is no space for the millennium. Because our argument is, and which we would have seen from a number of scriptures which we identified, I will glance back at a few again tonight for those who would have missed those scriptures, because they're very important in counteracting the particular argument that they might want to use, that the end of the world does not mean the end of the world as we think it does, because they have to fit a thousand year reign in there. All right, let, let's, let's look at one of those passages that will refute that argument. We are, we are saying that when Christ returns, that that is the end of the world, is the end of the age, is the end of all things, is the end of this dispensation, and what will be ushered in is the consummate kingdom, which is eternity that will be ushered in. There is no space for a millennium. Jesus never taught it. His disciples never taught it. And, and you will look at all those passages that we read from Isaiah just now, which they say are referring to the millennium. You see no space, no word, no reference at all in any of those passages to a thousand years. Even if the, the word millennium is not 
with um, used, there's no reference, no mention even of a thousand year period to come. And if Isaiah was speaking um, so demonstratively about the kingdom of God, why is it that he would not have seen this future reign of Christ? He would have only seen the first advent because that's all the kingdom was referring to from Isaiah's prophecy. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see what that says. First Corinthians 15, and I read from verse 20. I would have shared this passage before, but again, some people might have missed those sessions, and I want you to see the references that were drawn to show that when Christ comes back, there's no room for a millennium. There is an end to all things. We are going to read from verse 22. I remember in First Corinthians, Paul was dealing with the resurrection. And what happens at the resurrection and the mortals shall put on immortality. We shall all be changed. We shall become a different sort of people. So we are not people with the nature that goes into the millennium. Verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, because he's the first of of those who were resurrected on, on his own from the grave. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. You see what that is saying? Christ is the first fruit of those that were that came back from the grave. And afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. So those persons who belong to Christ will be resurrected and they are going to be resurrected at his coming. Then cometh the end. Watch the language of Paul, very precise, very clear, it's not symbolic, it, it, is, it is not poetic language, it, it is not hyperbole, it is not figurative language, it is plain, simple language. I remember we said, use texts that are plain and straightforward to help you interpret texts that are figurative or symbolic. And Paul is saying here that Christ will resurrect those that are his at his coming. And then cometh the end. I don't know how you can interpret that, but just that the end comes after the resurrection. And the end comes at Christ's coming. Then cometh the end, and it goes on. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. What kingdom? If you are now waiting for a millennial kingdom to take place after Christ returns, and Paul is saying that Christ returns and he hands over the kingdom. What kingdom? That's the kingdom that has been made up of all the people who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. He is now handing us over. He's now presenting us faultless to the throne. He is now presenting to the Father all the saints that would have been, that have received him. The dead in Christ that rise, plus those that were living at his coming, that is the kingdom. And he hands that over at the end. Even the Father, when he shall have put all rule and authorities put down, sorry, all rule and authority and power. Put down everything. He brings an end to all rule and all power and all authority. An end to it. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. He must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. Which means that Christ was reigning spiritually reigning with his saints. Those that had died and their disembodied spirits were reigning with him in paradise and those that were alive are reigning with him spiritually as part of his kingdom. And he must reign till he has put all enemies on his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So how are you going to get death then occurring after Christ comes back and brings an end to the last enemy, which is death. And people are still going to live a thousand years. And obviously some people are going to die because everybody going into the millennium would not be people who are immortal. Bear that in mind. So, so that is another point which would destroy their argument of a literal millennial reign. 
because it means that the people who will not have been resurrected from the grave would be people going into a millennium and they would have been people who would have been living on earth when Christ returned, which means that they would not have been immortal. So they are going to die again. And then, as they say, resurrected after 3,000 years for the great ritual judgment if they were not Christians. So if the last enemy is death and Christ reigns until the last enemy is, is put away and that happens when Christ returns, it means that there cannot be life continuing after Christ because it means that death would occur and then the enemy of death will not have been really put away because death will still occur in the millennium because you are going to be carrying immortal people into the millennial kingdom. Uh, how should that happen? That is not um, scripturally accurate. And it does not fit in with the full picture. Now, a few other passages that we look at to show that the end comes when, when Christ returns. And we're going to look at John, the very author of, of, of the, the book of, of John, and who is the person recording the book of Revelation. So we must take um, seriously what he says in John chapter 6. Now we can look at John chapter 5 and John chapter 6. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Now, I'm using these to refute the arguments that the millennials are putting forward. So you have a strong position as to why you would not support their particular perspective. Marvel not. John chapter 5, verse 28. says, Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And that is going to happen at the last day. How do we know that? We turn to chapter 6 and look at verse 39 and 40. And I want you to notice that in that passage, that when the resurrection takes place, both the just and the unjust are resurrected. What the, what the premillennialists say is that the first resurrection is the bodily resurrection that takes place at the rapture. Because I'm going to show you tonight that we, 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 we don't have two literal bodily resurrections. We have a spiritual resurrection and a physical bodily resurrection. We have a first spiritual death and a second um, separation from God, which is the second death. And, and again, this will refute the argument that the premillennialists are making when we look at Revelation chapter 20 and look at what is meant by the first resurrection and then what is meant by the second resurrection. So they say that the second resurrection takes place after the millennium where only the unsaved. So what they argue, and it cannot match with the scripture, you look at the whole picture, is that there, there, there's a separation of a thousand years between the resurrections. The first one takes place at the rapture and time goes on, there's a seven year tribulation, then Christ comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom. And then after the thousand year reign on earth, he resurrects the unsaved dead, which means that there are two physical resurrections separated by at least a thousand and seven years. We don't have any place in scripture that supports that line of argument, nowhere, because we see all the scriptural references speaking of the dead save and the dead on save rising together there's no separation by a thousand years plus a seven year tribulation there's no support for that in the scripture look at what john chapter 6 says here verse 39 and this is the father's will which has sent me that all which he have given me i should lose nothing but shall raise it up again at the last day. Now, again, you can't have anything after the last. And what Christ is saying is that all the people that God have given to him, all the saints, all the Christians that are a part of the king kingdom, those that have died, he is going to raise them up at the last day. That, 
that's the end of the world, the end of the age, however you want to put it. That when Christ return is the last day. Paul made that clear in Philippians, that in, the, in Corinthians we just read, and John, the disciple who also wrote um, the, the record in Revelation, is saying that Christ is going to raise those that belong to him at the last day. And he says in verse 40, again, it's repeated. And this is the will of him that have sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believe on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, you, you can't have anything beyond the last day. The last day is the last day. And if Christ himself says that the resurrection of the just and the unjust take place at the same time, and he is saying that he's resurrecting the, the, the Christians at the last day, which means that the unsaved are also resurrected at the last day, because he just said in the first reference that both of them, they that have done good, eternal life, and they that have done evil, on eternal damnation. So that's the second argument refuted that the Prebellionists are putting forward. So one, we see the kingdom passages in Isaiah are figurative passages referring to the kingdom of Christ at his first advent and not the millennial kingdom. We are saying that the, the coming of Christ brings an end of the world, the end of the age, just different terms used, but it's the end of everything confirmed in Corinthians, confirmed here in John, and I gave you the passages which I will not go back to for the sake of time in Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the tears and the wheat and the parable of the net. And in both of those passages, it said that the harvest is the end of the world. The end, the end of the world. You won't call it the end of the age, it's the end of the world because it's the last day. And it says that God will send forth his angels to gather the elect and he will resurrect them and bring everybody together. And those parables confirm that the resurrection again takes place at the last day and we cannot have anything after the last day. All right. Then we had the passage in, in Second Peter chapter 3, which speaks of the end of the world. And we say now there's no space. There's, so there's no time for the millennium, according to Jesus' teaching. And there's no space. Second Peter chapter 3. We hinted at these, but we were looking at the references now. So you have actual references that you can write down and you can look back at. And for those who have missed the sessions that we would have done previously, you have reference because I want to make sure that you are learning and you're grasping. So I'm just trying to fill in little gaps that might have been missed. Um, I know you're anxious to, to, to get on to, to finishing the, the Revelation 20 and then the Battle of Armageddon and, and those things. But as I said, we'll get there. We'll take our time and we'll complete it. It says here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now he's using the same language that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 25 about his coming like a thief in the night. Peter is using the same language in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. So you ain't got any time? No, you don't have any space because when that day comes, the, 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 um, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, consumed. Christ brings an end to all things when he returns, even this world as we know it. Now that's what Peter is saying. If you have a different interpretation, I'll pause after this one and you can tell me what you think. Um, about the passage that I read and what I have mentioned so far. If you have any questions or comments, you can make them. Seeing then, all these things shall be dissolved. He mentions it in more than one way. What man of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and, and godliness, looking for and hasten unto the coming of the day of the Lord. See, you looking for it because it brings an end to all things. Where in the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved. He mentions it again. And the element shall melt with fervent heat. Repetition or emphasis. And notice the connection. It's when Christ comes. This 
symbolizes again, well, it's speaking in, in direct terms, that the end comes at Christ's coming. So again, it's a hole in the argument of the millennialists because Peter says and confirms that Christ's return is the last day. It's the end of all things. And I do not see the space for a millennium. Now, one more thing before I come in. I give you a chance to come in. They argue that the millennium has to be because there are promises that God made to the Jews that were not fulfilled. And therefore, since the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, he, he must, he is obligated to fulfill these promises. And the only place that they can happen is in the millennium because they argue that the Jews must be saved. Now, one thought on this. We have seen ample time given to the Jews to receive their Messiah. Jesus condemned them for it, that they, they killed the prophets. And even when God sent his son, they killed him too. He said that in a parable, but he was speaking directly to the Jews and how they treated the prophets and how they treated the Messiah. And he told them as a result, judgment will come on them. Them. And his temple was destroyed and, 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 and God's covenant was now established among the Gentiles, the new covenant. Now, we also saw Daniel, a grace period of 490 years was given to the Jews after they rebelled and rebelled and rebelled for centuries and God forgave them, reconciled them. They went back into rebellion. He got, he, they were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar. They were carried away by the Assyrians. All sorts of judgment were brought upon the children of Israel. And Amos says, the Lord says, well, Lord, I will come myself because you are not responding to the judgment that is being sent on you. Now, with all that time that they were given, plus the time between Christ's advent and now is, 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 is basically over 2,000 years. Jews, the Jews had all of that time to repent as a nation, and they're still rejecting the Messiah. Now, you want to tell me that God will judge the Gentiles because that's what the Prevalentists will say. He will judge the Gentiles who are on stage when he returns, but he will usher the Jews into this millennial period and he give them another thousand years to get saved as a nation because Paul will is that all the Jews will be saved. And that because that was not fulfilled, I realized then there has to be a chance given for the Jews to be saved. Now, you're telling me that the Jews got all this time. And it would really be injustice on God's part to judge the Gentiles, but give the Jews another thousand years after all the time that they would have had to, to get saved. And, and then, really and truly, what about the Jews that have already died? So all the Jews really technically, literally can't be saved. Because they're Jews dying now that have not accepted Christ, they're lost. They're Jews that died even when Christ was on the earth and rejected him, they're lost. So all Jews can't be saved literally. So I will not buy that argument that God um, has to fulfill the promises. And, and another thing is that a lot of the promises that God made, read the Old Testament, were conditional promises. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you refuse and you rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. Now remember, a covenant is an agreement between two people. And if you break the contract, then the person, the other person is not obligated to keep any of the promises. God is not obligated to keep any promises that were not fulfilled because the Jews broke the covenant relationship. It's just like an insurance company. You don't pay your insurance premium. The, the insurance company is not obligated. Then when your house burns down or your car gets destroyed to, be, to, to honor any commitment, if you do not pay your premiums. So my argument is, is that the covenant relationship God established with the Jews was conditional. And if they break their part of the agreement, God is not obligated. You now, if in mercy, God wants to do certain things for the Jews, sure. But don't tell me that God is obligated to keep the promises. He's not because the contract has been violated and God is not obligated to honor anything because it was conditional. And I read a lot from the Old Testament and see Promises were conditional. If you did them, you get the benefit. And if you don't do them, you get the judgment. So God is not obligated in the future to have to do anything when the Jews violate it. All right, a pause for some questions or some comments.
and I hope that you are a little more enlightened and that you understand now what I wanted you to do last week when I was asking you to come up with some arguments that you would have already been taught uh -huh. that would go against what the premillennialists um, say. Then we will move on to look at the resurrections. So pause. I believe we have a query comment from Pastor Carrington. Yes. Hi, Brother Jackman. Um, yes, Brother John, good to hear you. You too, my brother. How is it possible that we can feed our spears? Um, we can feed our spears and spouse shares and that kind of stuff. I thought we stopped fighting wars with spears and, and, and swords and that thing millennia ago. We now fight wars. We don't even have to leave the country we are in to fight a war. That's right. We have we have, we have the potential of interballistic missiles. We have the potential of drones and uh, uh, my aircraft. I mean, you can you can think that that could be a literal understanding, not in this present day. But that's just my comment. Right, and that and that is a very good comment by the John. You see, because. We, we are projecting a future, and a future then that these things will not make sense at all, as you rightfully said. Now, when we come to the Battle of Armageddon, and they talk about 200,000 Chinese coming to, to gather in the Valley of Jehoshaphat to fight against the Jews, it, again, it comes back to the, to the, to the argument. I mean, why are people be gathering in a valley to fight hand to hand come back? When you've got missiles, when you've got nuclear weapons, that, that, that people in our age will be using if they engage in any war. So, so again, that refutes the whole literal interpretation that they are playing with these things. But we, we leave that to when we get to the Battle of Armageddon. We're not getting there yet, but I guess connecting that point, because the point you made is a significant point. You can't now be looking at that to, to carry forth the future when who will be beating spears um, into plowshares and the, you know, the swords, the spears in the pony hooks and the, and the sword in the pro shares. No, it is not a literal um, rendition there. All right, thank you for that comment, Brother John. Good night, Reverend Jackman. Yes, Brother Randy. Yes, I'm here. Got in late, but now All I right. want to ask you one question. What are your thoughts on the Jews? Because you know you hear this talk about the Jews returning to Jerusalem. Yes. What are your thoughts about that, the Jews returning to Jerusalem? And then my next question would be, would you say that the Jews today are God's chosen people? Because you know some people still say that. Would you say under the dispensation of grace that the Jews are God's chosen people? And what are your thoughts on the Jews we, because some people said before, I think it's saying about Armageddon, she mentioned that the Jews can return to Jerusalem. What are your thoughts on that? All right. Now, again, that is an interpretation which they they have based on some of the scriptural references, references that they have, have made. But if all the Jews are going to return to Jerusalem, now Jerusalem is going to be a real crowded place because... Now, again, and they're going to be saying that these are going to be signs that would um, sort of precede Christ's coming. Now, you've got, you've got millions of Jews in Russia, in the United States, um, in, in many of the other European countries, in Great Britain. There are Jews all over the place that, as, they, as the word indicated, they have been scattered. And what they are literally expecting is that all the Jews are going to return to Jerusalem. No, I don't see the literal application of that, but that is what they believe. And, and then, as I indicated, we, we, we were thinking of a, of a special edition where we look at, at the Jews and see who we are really speaking about when we talk about the Jews are, are the people who we are seeing living in Israel now are really the Jews that we would have been reading about, uh, making a reference to in the Old Testament, and even in the references made in New Testament, these are things that we have to consider. But we won't go into that now because 
those those are some topics that was for um, a little sort of controversy and debate, which I don't want to get into now. But but there are some interesting topics which people have begun to in, engage a lot of study on. And as they say, there there's some very interesting revelations that come out of those studies when we examine them in the nature of of of, of the world. But Again, if you're looking for that to happen, which means that that's a prediction that will still have to be in the future because there are still millions of Jews all over the world. And I don't know where the space is going to come from for it to return. Then plus all the, the, the living Christians that have been resurrected. Then plus, sorry, all the Christians that have been resurrected. Then plus all the ones that have been living on the, on the earth at the time. Listen, they are going to add to billions and where, how are you going to literally put those to reign in Jerusalem with Christ? So you see the whole logistics of it. If you're going to look at it literally, it, it is not going to add up in the, in the context of, of how and Israel is a small place. So I, I, I have um, my, my, my doubts about the application of, of that. Not all the Jews might return from all the countries, but you might get um, Jews moving back to their homeland. And I think they have said that over the, the last decade, there have been a number of Jews that have repatriated and gone back to Jerusalem. But that does not include the whole diaspora. There are millions of Jews still all over the place. So I do not know how that will literally unfold. But you know, that is something you could do some more investigation on and more references um, from the scripture to see how we, we can interpret that. Uh, uh, German. Yes. Uh, quick com uh, comment. Um, I think you will mention earlier this um, the distinction between the age, the end of the world, and the end of the age. And yes. I found it interesting that it's very possible that that, that distinction may very well have been what uh, contributed to the so many theories of the end of the world in the past. Persons would have linked the ages with the astrological ages and somehow managed to link this with the timeline of Christian history to somehow determine the end of the world. Yes. And, and, and that, is, that is true because people have tried to make that distinction. That is one of the things that have created uh, a lot of the, the debate and the, and the controversy. You see, because they want to see the end of the age as the end of the church age or the end of this dispensation. So, so what they will accept, yes, that we are living in the church age now, which is the, the, um, the dispensation of grace. That's what we refer to as the dispensation of grace. Because, you know, the premillennialists have, um, they're, they're called the dispensational premillennialists because they divide um, God's relationship with, with people into seven distinct dispensations and, and the millennial dispensation will be one of the dispensations which is to come and they see this as what we refer to as the dispensation of grace we are now in the grace period um so what they're saying is that is the end of the age is the end of this dispensation but remember they have another dispensation to come which is the 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 um dispensation of the millennium a thousand more years so that's why they would argue that the, the end of the world is really referring to the end of this dispensation. But we can see clearly that from those passages we read, the coming of Christ um, or the return of Christ the second time is really the end of, of the world. And, and there's even a, a verse in Hebrew chapter 9, verse 28. It's a verse that some of we might but not have really picked up on, but it says something very interesting here. And this is the English Standard Version that renders it this way. So Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many. No, if he's offered once to bear the sins of many, that is referring to his first advent. When he was crucified, he bore the sins of many. That's the same comment that was made by Daniel. He shall not, he shall be cut off, but not for himself, but for others, but for many. Daniel made that same comment. Christ didn't die because of his own sin. He died because of the sins of many people. And Hebrews here mention it by, by the Apostle Paul. 
he was offered wants to bear the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not two different times, a rapture, and then after the tribulation, he would appear the second time. He was offered once, and he would appear a second time. So if there's a first, there's a second. Not to deal with sin. So, so Christ ain't dealing with saving any Jews when he comes back. They have their chance to be saved all. You know, in this dispensation, in what we be termed is the extended period, which we call the thousand year um, millennial period, which we said is not a literal uh, period. It's it's a it's a prolonged period from Christ's advent to his second coming, which is the dispensation of grace, which they have time to be saved and they are still rejecting Christ as a nation. Now there are some Jews that have accepted Christ. There, there has been a remnant of Jews that have always responded to Christ and I believe that there are some Jews in our modern day area that have accepted Christ. But as a nation the Jews have not yet received Christ as their savior. And he will return a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting his coming or waiting for him. That's what Christ's return is going to be for those who are waiting to be taken with him as he has promised. And that is a simple verse there, but it's very, very clear that Christ was offered once for the sin of the world and he's coming a second time not to deal with sin. He was offered to deal with sin already. And when he said it is finished, that is what was finished. His sacrifice for sin was complete. And you now have all of this grace period, all of this millennial age that we are in to be saved. And if you reject that, now how could that match up with the word of God, which says that now is the accepted time, today is the day of salvation. And if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And yet, having said all of that, you're going to come back and give people a chance to be saved. Well, the ones that rejected are going to have to be judged and people get another thousand years because all Jews will not be living. They will have people that are Gentiles that are still living in, in other parts of the world because the only people living on the earth will be people in Jerusalem. Certainly not. So it's a, it's a whole complication if you try to look at the whole picture and it will bring confusion and the Bible is not a book of confusion. It's very clear and it's very precise once you interpret it the right way. So again, Revelation does mention a first resurrection. It does not mention a second resurrection. And, and, and I concluded from, from the last session that it means then that the first resurrection will have to be a spiritual, spiritual resurrection. The text did say, blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection on which the second death has no power. Now, we did say it, there's no mention of a first death in, the, in that text. It mentions a second death. There's no mention of a second resurrection in that text, but it mentions a first. But obviously, if there's a first, there's a second. So the first resurrection will obviously be a spiritual resurrection because we do not have two literal bodily resurrections. That's why I proceeded to deal with those scriptures first, that you get a clear understanding when we get here, that the Bible does not teach two physical bodily resurrections. All the dead and all the Christians, sorry, all the dead that are in the grave will hear his voice and shall come forth. That was made very, very clear. And those were Jesus' words. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming that which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good and they that have done evil. The parables in Matthew chapter 13 mention the same thing. The wheat and the tears grown together until the end. The fish and the net are together and you separate them at the end which is the end of the world, which is the last day. There's no more time after that, so there cannot be two bodily resurrections, one occurring at the rapture, and then another one occurring. As a matter of fact, I indicated that according to their perspective, you're going to have more than, than two resurrections because according to their teaching, one would have to occur at the rapture. That's what they say. At the rapture, 
Christians are resurrected and snatched away and carried to heaven for, with, to reign with Christ for seven years. But remember, there's no part in the Bible that mentioned this seven-year period. They took that out of Daniel. And we say that that cannot be a proper interpretation of the word because the 490 years is a full period of time that was allocated. It said that was determined for the Jews and for Jerusalem and for what God was going to do to Jerusalem and what he was going to, uh, at the time he was going to give them to receive reconciliation and to turn away from their iniquity. That was 490 years. You cannot pluck seven out of that and project it 2,000 years down the road. That is not a proper application because there's no where in Daniel that, that that is even hinted. But they must get in the seven-year tribulation. So they pull that seven, that one week, which should be seven years, out of that context and push it for the future. That's how they get seven years of tribulation. But there's no part of the Bible mentioned seven years of tribulation. I did indicate, I believe we are going to get tribulation. The world is going through tribulation already. The Christians encounter tribulation already. And the devil is going to pursue Christians to the end. He pursued them at the beginning. He's going to be loose for a season. Now, uh, uh, last week I said I, I do not understand why he had been loose for the season. Why we could not terminate the devil one time when Christ comes back to bring judgment. Um, sorry, why he would have to be loose for a season before Christ uh, returns to the earth since he had been restricted for that um millennial period and he's loose for a season but i am recalling that that the word indicates people who reject the gospel over and over again they shall be torn turned over so it is it, like they're, they're going to be released then to satan to, to to bring judgment on them for not receiving the gospel that is the implication that you get um, um, sometimes coming from the word like remember the, the, the person in the Corinthian church who was involved in morality and Paul told them that to release him to Satan to be judged for his disobedience and rebellion and the Bible does say that because people refuse to believe the truth they shall believe a lie so, so I think really that being loose for season is, is again to bring judgment on people who have been rejecting the gospel and, and, and Satan is going to go all out to do what he can to, 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 to assault the, the world. And, and that is also going to be something that will bring hardship and tribulation on the earth. And Christians are going to be part of that. I don't believe that we're going to escape. Now, Revelation might be full of a lot of hyperbole. But I believe that some of these things in Revelation could actually specifically happen because they're not far removed from reality. And if you look at the bowls and the, and the vials open in Revelation, they, they, they speak of, of some tre tremendous um, things happening on the earth before Christ returns and, and judgment that will be unleashed on the world because of a disobedience. I remember I said last week that in the same way that, that Jesus brings judgment on the Jews for rejecting him with all the time they were offered, all it now people are having grace and they're rejecting it. So when this period is over and Satan is loose for a season, a lot of judgment is going to come on the earth and we're going to see some things happening. Now, as I said, some of it could be hyperbole, meaning the things look really outrageous. But remember that we had a tsunami in the Indian Ocean that, that 230 or thousand people were, were, were drowned, were killed. We had an earthquake in Haiti. Um, in, in 2010, and, and over 230,000 people were killed. We had a flood in, in China, I think it was in 1931, and 3.4 million people were, were drowned. Over 1.7 million square miles of, of land was flooded out. So yes, you can have some, some real catastrophes. And, and, and so some things in Revelation can actually literally happen. But, but we are going to be here. And the premillionists think that we will escape by being raptured, but no. So the first resurrection to me is not the rapture revelation, um, resurrection. The first resurrection, I think, is a spiritual resurrection. And the Bible does teach that. And we look at Ephesians 2, right, to pick up a scripture. There are a number of other references, but I, I only want to look at a few. I will give you some that you can check um, for yourself. 
But one we are very familiar with is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 to 5. You can even go a little further. Ephesians chapter 2. This is a spiritual resurrection. So the first resurrection that we are looking at here is a spiritual resurrection and, and it's, it's, it's recognized by the Bible and it's taught in scripture. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So that's a form of death. Spiritual death. And there's going to be a physical death. We shall all die as a result of sin. That's a physical death as well. And, and the second death is when we are completely separated from God in eternity. So we are still going to be alive. Because remember, the mortal puts on immortality after the resurrection. So you want us to be clear that it's not only Christians that are going to be immortalized. The unsaved are going to be immortalized. Because for you to go through an eternal judgment, you have to be immortalized. You have to be able to have an eternal and an immortal body that will live through eternity. So both Christians and the unsaved at resurrection are going to become immortal. But they're going to be separated from Christ, which is a second death. Separation from God is like death. And that's what Revelation 20 is, is speaking of. And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you were according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see what, what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus? You were once in that group of nations that were alienated from God because you were blinded. You were deceived by the devil. But now the gospel has reached you because Christ has come. And I am one of his apostles preaching that word to you. And you have been quickened through that message. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. You see how you were sinning and of the mind. And were by nature, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, spiritually speaking, have quickened us, resurrection, together with Christ and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Now that's a spiritual resurrection. And Paul is addressing it there to the church at Ephesus. And then you have Romans chapter 6, verse 4 to 13. You have Romans chapter 8. Colossians chapter 2, 12 and 13. And we have John chapter 5. We looked at that when we were speaking of the resurrection of the dead, but that also speaks of a spiritual resurrection. John chapter 5. You can glance back there. John chapter 5. Verse 24. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. That's a spiritual resurrection. And then he went on to say, Verily, verily, say unto you, the hour is coming now, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now he's speaking of both resurrections here. A spiritual resurrection in one verse, and a physical resurrection in the, in the other. You will hear my words, and pass from death to life, and then the hour is coming, that the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The dead. So we have a spiritual resurrection, and I believe that that resurrection that John is speaking of here is a spiritual resurrection in, in Revelation chapter 20. And the reason why that, that contradicts the, the premillennial position is because they say 
that that resurrection, when it says the rest of the day did not live until the thousand years were finished, that that is the final resurrection of the unsaved. So they're saying that that verse there, where John is saying and making that statement, is referring to the resurrection that takes place after the millennium, which they call the great resurrection judgment, which only unsaved people will be resurrected. But that can't be true because the text itself says this is the first resurrection. So if they say it is the last and the text is saying it is the first, it cannot be referring to a physical resurrection. So the first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection in which they, they are holy and blessed. And the second death will not have any power over those who are part of the first resurrection. Meaning, all the people who hear the voice of God and respond to his word have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. And the second death, which I said is eternal separation from God, it is not a physical death because the people who are separated from God in eternity will be alive forever. The punishment is an, is, is an everlasting punishment. When we get in to look at the, the final consummation, the end, we will discuss that because the Adventists have a, a different position on that. So we now have to look at Armageddon and we have to look at the final consummation. When all is ended and we are ushered into eternity, what is eternity going to be like? We don't have all the details in the Bible, but we have some understanding of some things which are very significant that are doctrinal and which there is debate about it. Good. So it's clear and simple. First resurrection, spiritual. And there's evidence in the Bible about it. We have been quickened spiritually. We have been resurrected from a dead state spiritually to be alive spiritually with Christ. We are going to die again because death is part of the reality of life. But we are going to be resurrected. But there is a second death that we will escape because we have been saved. That second death is eternal separation from God. Now, when you look at Revelation chapter 20, which they claim is only a reference to the unsaved that are coming up. If you notice that, it says that the books were open. And then another book. And it says that all that were in the grave came forth. Those that are in the sea, the sea gave up, is dead. Everybody is coming up at that resurrection. And, and the reason why the application is, is indicating that it is not just on save that coming up there. It saved the concept of the books and a book. And those that were not found written in the book of life. So the book of life will contain, well, as I say, not literally, but we are having um, record of those who have lived for Christ and record of those who have not lived for Christ. And at the resurrection, both groups are coming forward. That, that is the, the figurative expression of the books and the book. And the book of life and those found not within the book of life. Because if you're only judging the unsaved, there's, you don't have to look in the book of life because they're not there. You already know that. So the book of life will contain those who are saints and the, those who are not found there are the unsaved. So in that final judgment in Revelation, that final resurrection which we see there, that is still in a, in a way referring to, to both groups. And, and all through the, the, the New Testament, we see the reference to both groups coming up at the last day. All right, so I pause there. It's nine o'clock now, but we usually give a few minutes for if there are any questions or any comments that you want to make. So overall, I, I believe we should have a clear understanding that Revelation 20 is very symbolic because it's part of a very symbolic book. And that our interpretation is that a lot of the application here is symbolic application and that it is not reference to literal thousand year reign because a lot of other things do not fit the puzzle, do not fit the whole picture if you put a literal rain after Christ comes back. And I just try to show you how a lot of holes will, will be created in the picture that would have been painted by the premillennial group. And that's where we will have issues um, with their perspective. Good, so that's my final word and summary of, of 20. Um, any questions you have? And we're going to be picking up on the Battle of Armageddon 
um, next week and look into the, the final um, consummation at the ending of all things. And if you want to, because I hinted at this, I could do a, a special edition on the timeline for the, the Christmas, meaning the, the time of Jesus' birth and a timeline for Christ's crucifixion, just to deal with the timeline to show you how we have an indication in scripture as to some time references in relation to those things. That could be a special edition if you want that to happen. But the Battle of Armageddon and the final um, eternal um, consummation will end our whole study of, of the end time events and the eschatology of the last days. So over to you for a few questions or comments if you want to at this time. I believe Pastor clear Carrington anything. Been, yes. I believe Pastor Carrington would have been putting a couple comments in the chat. Um, yes. I think we have also had a comment to make at some point in time. That's somebody to me or Pastor John? Yeah, just look at this, Pastor John. Um, I, just, I was just giving, um, adding credence to the, the test you had put up for the resurrection, both Daniel 12, 2 and uh, Acts 24 and 15, both speak yes. of a general right. res resurrection as identified by John. So right. that, um, just in reference to the four who are listening, that they can find, even in the Old Testament, reference to a general resurrection. There will be a general yes. resurrection. But the right. spiritual right. resurrection... Right. The spiritual resurrection happens to us while we yet live, while we are yet in mortal bodies. Yes. Um, general resurrection is when we are translated or we are resurrected depending on whether we are dead or alive when Christ comes. Correct. All right. Thank you for that, Brother John. That's very correct. Good evening, Reverend Jackman. Good evening to you. Brother Spooner, it is? Yes, it is. Um, right. Just an observation. Um, I was think a lot of persons are getting confused with the end of the world and the end of the earth and so on. But I think that um, it is more the end, if you were to use the end of the system, mm -hmm. because people may think it is a, a literal end of the world. You know, like... Um, because John talked about um, he see a new heaven and a new earth coming down. And yes. people may take that literal that is it. But if 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 he is seeing if he saw a new heaven and a new earth, that means that the earth would have been um literally disappeared. Yes. For a new one to replace it. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, I I I, I and, you, and, you don't, and you don't feel so. So what, what are you talk no, about what Peter no. said? I believe what, what that. What are you talking about what Peter said? system. What um, Peter said, I will, ha I will have to check what Peter what, Yeah, what I, Peter read it, I read it. I read 2 Peter. But, oh, but, but, but sorry to cross you, um, Brother Spooner. But remember, Peter said the elements and the works. The elements and the works. So he referred mm. to the works which you will call the system. They shall be destroyed. So he's talking about destruction of two things. The system, yes, which yes. I agree with you. And, and and remember, Corinthians said that Jesus will bring an end to all rule and all authority. All these systems will come to an end. But there's also an end to this physical world. But we will debate that because that will come out as part of the of the eternity. Do we live on this earth? Or are we are is are we being placed on a new heaven and a new earth? Now you're saying that you don't agree with that. So you're you're believing then. That we will live on this earth restored? Well, there's a school of thought that the earth will be um, a paradise. Yes, yes, I know there's a school of thought. There, there's a school of thought for a lot of things, and that's why we discuss the word. So you, you are right, Brad Spooner. There's a school of thought that believes that the mm -hmm. earth will be restored to what it mm -hmm. was originally and that we will live down here. You believe that? You were in that school? <laughs> Uh, no, you're Jews, not school. It's nothing wrong. It's nothing wrong. No, 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 yes, no, 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 a lot the, of theologians um, are in that school too. You don't think that is any out. indictment? Huh? The jury is still out on that. As far as yes. I'm concerned, okay. the jury is still out on that. 
Right. That's why we like to look at the scripture to see uh, because we have to have a verdict one way or the other because both can't be right. You see what I mean? So yes, the jury is out. Yeah. And you are not alone by the spooner. There are a lot of, mm. of prominent theologians that support mm. your view that the earth will be restored or redeemed and we will live back down here. But remember, I, I quote some simple verses the last time, as long as the earth remains. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass, but not my words. What does he mean by that? So that will come up in the discussion by the spooner. Next, the, at least when we get on to that part. The final consummation. Mm -hmm. Where will we spend eternity? So you you can hold that thought, but it's more. Oh. I know at least know what camp you in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the, um, <laughs> just 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 briefly, we want to touch on um, another yes. one. Um, somebody somebody had mentioned about yeah, the Jews. If the Jews can literally return to um, the Jerusalem, to, to yes. Israel, or, yes. um, but. Jesus himself has said in um in Saint Revelation, speaking um through John when he was addressing the um the church at Smyrna, he said that yet you are rich. Uh, uh -huh. I know your slander of those who say they are Jews, Jews. and are not. Uh -huh. Yes, but are a synagogue of Satan. Uh huh. There, there are people living. In Israel right now, yes. claiming to be Jews, and they are not right. Jews. Agree. They can't. They, they 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 cannot trace their 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 roots to none of the original Jews from the Bible. Right. They they're not. None they're not Semitic. Right. They're not Semitic. They're not descendants from Shem. No. They're not. They cannot trace. Yes. They cannot trace their, their roots nowhere. But they claim it to be Jews. Uh-huh. Uh, you remember Paul made a statement too that not that not all are, are Jews who say they are Jews. Paul made that no. statement too. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right by the spooner. And that, that is something that they said, but you mean that that be for another discussion. But there are a lot of people who are living in Israel that are not Semitic. They are not. They are not descendant to the line, the line of 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 Shem. They have they have come from over in Europe, and they might have been descendants from from the line of Japheth, which are the the, the Japhites, which are more of the Caucasian European. Yeah, the Caucasian. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the Caucasian. The Caucasian, yeah. right? But again, they said those are things you know, that will open people's eyes and we will get a lot of debate on them. So if, if people want me to tackle that, I can look into that as a study. But but that would really open up a can of worms. And then as they we, say, we, we, we all, love have that. All, you want to have that? <laughs> love that. <laughs> right. Oh, and, yeah. and, the, and the question has arisen too. Are all the Jews like those people that we see that in Israel? Or were any of the Jews originally no. like us? No. Dark skin. Um, if if Shem, if if we if we going by the fact that Shem is the progenitor of the black races, the original Jews, the Jews of the Bible, yes. could not be could not be like the people who live in Israel now. All right. Well. Point, point and, it been, by the and, it has, and it has been proven, Barbie. Yes, I said point taken, but 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 we have to hold that. We have to put that on hold because maybe we open up a whole can that is going to make people eyes pop. So you you hold that there, brother Spooner. If 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 we get some time, we can look into that. All right, but don't don't open up that can now because we we going into some deep waters there. But but you are you are on to some 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 important thoughts and line of of of, of examination and I mean biblical scholarship, which has opened people's eyes to a lot of things that we were were um, blinded to, and and a lot of things that we were really taught, but not having the truth from the word. But we we put that on hold by the spooner. But that's an interesting point that you would have raised there. And as I said, there's a lot of study now going into that. 
a lot of people doing genetic research in a lot of parts of the world and finding that some of the lineage of people who are dark skinned trace back to the same lineage genetically of the original Jewish line. But we hold that. Just want to hold that. But thank you for those interjections. And, and um, I'm glad that you are in one of those schools because we will have a good debate looking at where we spend eternity. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brother Spooner. All right, Jeff, it seems like there's no more comments and no more um, questions. I know some people's minds are being stirred now for some things that they will want answered because the Battle of Armageddon, and as I say, and our final consummation should open up some new things to us. So we're going to stop there for tonight. We've got some more good discussion to come in the following sessions. So thank you for right. being with us. God bless you and over, over to Brother Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Jackman. Um, Sandra Pollard Bostick is saying, thanks, Eddie, for explaining Revelation 20. It is now so very clear. All so, right. Um, so, so that has been made clear. Um, to I'm her, glad for that. So. I hope other people are clear too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the session on the Battle of Armageddon and so on with encouraging yes. persons to, to do some reading, do some research so that it could be interactive. Thank you, Pastor John, and for all the others who would have shared. And I'm going to ask